Ronde. Okay, I think we can start. Colleagues from everywhere, Egypt, Morocco, Greece, Peru, Japan, China. So, okay, hello everyone. Uh, on behalf of the IOMP, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to the International Medical Physics Week webinars organized by the IOMP school. IOMP represents about uh, 25,000 medical physicists worldwide, working in all areas of medical physics. Uh, the, the webinar yesterday was on uh, X-ray imaging, uh, principles of CT dosimetry, image quality. Uh, today and tomorrow, we'll focus on radiation therapy. Uh, our speaker today, Dr. Lorenzo Bruala, is an excellent colleague working in the field of proton therapy. Uh, but first, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Professor Eva Bezak. Good Eva, evening, everyone. Uh, Eva lives in uh, Adelaide, Australia, and works in the University of South Australia. Uh, she's also the Secretary General of the IOMP. So, Eva, okay. the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Good evening, everyone. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And to a degree, uh, I'll be a bit cheeky. It's right that I am chairing this session because I am from Adelaide. And today's topic is on proton therapy. And Bragg Peak was discovered by Sir William Henry Bragg here in Adelaide in Australia at the beginning of the last century. You all know that protons and heavy ion particles are considered to be ideal particles for use in external beam radiotherapy due to their superior properties of dose distribution that results in higher and more conformal dose to the tumor, while the dose to the healthy tissues is much less as compared to the traditional X-ray radiation produced by Linux. And we have seen all around the world rapid establishment of new proton facilities in the last decade or more uh, all around the uh, uh, all countries. But things are never simple. We all understand that accurate radiation delivery is a must. However, several factors contribute to the overall accuracy of treatment including algorithms used for determination of ionization chamber quality factors and for computation of absorbed dose distributions in patients. In this context, Monte Carlo methods are considered to be the state of the art. In this webinar that I am welcoming you to participate in, an overview of the current status on determination of ionization chamber quality factors in proton therapy will be given. Current efforts being developed in this field will be presented. In particular, the benchmarking process of the newly developed extension for proton simulation within Monte Carlo General Purpose Radiation Transport Code, Penelope. Our esteemed speaker tonight is Dr. Lorenzo Bruaya, who is a private docent of experimental radiation oncology at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Duisburg Essen in Germany. He is also a researcher at the West German Proton Therapy Center of Essen. He obtained his PhD in physics at the Technical University of Catalonia in Spain. His research activities are related with the Monte Carlo simulation of radiotherapy and dosimetry problems, both with conventional as well as with proton therapy. He is the author of the freely distributed Monte Carlo Dose Verification System Primo for simulation of medical linear accelerators and absorbed dose distribution in patients. Without much more talking, I will hand over to Lorenzo. I would like to ask you to type your questions into chat and following Lorenzo's presentations, I will be moderating the discussion that means that I will be reading your questions to Lorenzo. Thank you and enjoy the evening. 
Lorenzo, you can start Thank you. sharing. Thank you, Eva, uh, for this very nice uh, introduction. And also thanks to, to John for, for inviting me to, to this uh, webinar. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. So let me first make sure that our, is everybody uh, seeing yeah. the, the screen? Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the introduction and, and you, uh, Eva, uh, precisely nailed down the, the point of, of proton uh, therapy, which is the, the very nice uh, absorbed dose distributions that you can get. Uh, however, uh, this comes uh, at a price, uh, which is that we need uh, to increase uh, the accuracy of uh, our dosimetry. And uh, this is the, the, uh, the main topic of, of this uh, webinar. The webinar is uh, divided uh, first uh, in an introduction to proton therapy, very briefly. Uh, then uh, we will go through an introduction uh, to Monte Carlo methods uh, in radiotherapy, not only proton therapy uh, in general. And uh, then we will move uh, to, to see which are the, the pitfalls that can occur during Monte Carlo simulation of uh, dosimetry problems in uh, proton therapy. And we will see three examples of uh, current uh, research problems in which we are uh, working in in the symmetry using Monte Carlo simulation. So this is the, the pretty much the same uh, plot that you showed, uh, Eva, uh, which shows the, the Bragg peak. Uh, protons, uh, as they uh, enter uh, into water, uh, deposit dose. And uh, the deposited dose, uh, it is more or less constant uh, throughout the the beginning of the, of the slowing down process of the, of the proton until uh, a large uh, amount of dose is delivered and uh, at the distal end of the delivery of uh, the dose, there is virtually no, no dose uh, delivered. This is the, the nice characteristic that uh, we shall exploit in uh, proton therapy. The fact that behind uh, the Bragg peak, there is no dose distribution. So to compare with uh, the typical uh, absorbed dose, depth dose distribution that uh, one obtains uh, in photon therapy, uh, in conventional uh, X-ray uh, therapy, uh, we see that photons behave like this. We have here a, a build-up region, then we have a, a maximum dose uh, at the very beginning uh, of the entrance, and then we have a, a slow uh, decaying tail in contrast with, uh, with uh, protons. However, our tumor is usually thicker than, than the thickness of this uh, Bragg peak, so we need uh, to produce what is called the spread out Bragg peak, which is the addition of several Bragg peaks, each obtained with different energies, that all of them add up to this uh, dose distribution. So this is the SOBP, the spread out Bragg peak, which is typically used in, in proton uh, therapy treatment. This is the typical comparison that, that you can see between uh, proton therapy on the right hand and uh, conventional uh, photon therapy on the left hand. Uh, with photon therapy, you usually get a, a dose, uh, low dose bath uh, around the planned target volume, uh, which is not the case in, in proton therapy. So the objectives uh, of proton therapy uh, are the, it allows dose escalation, increase the dose. That is uh, when one wants to improve tumor control by delivering a large, a larger dose with respect to uh, conventional radiotherapy, or uh, it allows to spare uh, normal tissue, therefore reducing adverse events and reducing also the irradiated volume, which in turn reduces the uh, radiation-induced secondary malignancies. So proton therapy is particularly uh, convenient in case where very high doses are needed, very sensitive patients or structures are involved, 
or very large irradiated volumes are involved. This translates into uh, the following uh, clinical targets. Uh, here I'm just naming just a few, just as, as examples. Case of very high doses like chordomas, or chondrosarcomas, or prostate cancer, where you need, these are very radiosensitive tumors that they need very high doses. Very sensitive tissue uh, or very sensitive patients. Uh, we are talking here in the case of sensitive tissue irradiation of eye tumors. In the case of sensitive patients, we are talking uh, about uh, pediatric patients. Uh, and this is particularly relevant for us at the, at the West German Proton Therapy Center where 80% uh, of our patients are, are children. Uh, or uh, when very large volumes uh, need to be radiated, for instance, in the case of craniospinal irradiation. This is to show you uh, which are the, the percentage of uh, sites irradiated at the West German Proton Therapy Center. Most of them are uh, head and neck, that coincides with uh, children, and, and a few more uh, spinal uh, irradiations. This adds nearly to 80% of our irradiations. Very few words about the beam delivery techniques because we will need that uh, in order to understand which, uh, why we are solving the kind of problems that we will show later. Uh, beam delivery traditionally uh, was done using single scattering uh, or double scattering techniques without entering into details. That means that we have uh, a pencil uh, beam, uh, pro uh, proton beam, that is spread uh, using either single scattering or double scattering. And then uh, it is conformed uh, uh, using apertures, bl blocks of uh, material uh, to uh, limit the, the shape of the tumor. And then we have uniform scanning, which is uh, some, something in between double scattering and uh, pencil beam scanning that is there is a, a movement of the pencil beam uh, and the last developed technique is pencil beam scanning, which is uh, similar to what we uh, know from all uh, CRT uh, TVs. You have a pencil beam uh, of ionized matter, uh, electro electrically charged uh, particles, which are protons, and you can direct this beam with uh, two pairs of uh, magnets. So you can paint the, the tumor uh, without any need uh, of a scattering. This pencil beam scanning technique is the one that is uh, currently uh, installed in, in most centers and the other techniques uh, still, uh, although they are still in use, uh, they are not longer uh, installed, at least uh, not massively installed as uh, in contrast uh, to pencil beam scanning. So let's say we have two, uh, essentially two ways of doing the beam delivery. One is putting material uh, layers in front of the, of the pencil beam and uh, scattering, producing a scattering. And the other is just directing the, the, pen, the pencil beam. So entering into uh, Monte Carlo codes for radiation transport, uh, there is uh, a wealth of, uh, widely distributed uh, Monte Carlo codes. Uh, it is common that people uh, talk about, mm, I did that with Monte Carlo simulation, uh, I obtained these results with Monte Carlo, but these sentences usually uh, mean little more than I just used uh, some random numbers to, to obtain my, my results. There are many Monte Carlo codes and, and depending on the Monte Carlo codes and how they are applied, uh, that would that will uh, derive into the, into the accuracy of the results that, that uh, I am obtaining. So uh, codes can be classified as general purpose. Uh, general purpose codes are those that 
general purpose radiation transfer Monte Carlo codes are those that cover a wide range of energy from about one kilo electron volt up to one giga electron volt. They can simulate any material uh, in arbitrarily complex geometries. And examples of these codes are GN4, MCNP, Fluca. Uh, all these uh, three codes, they deal with uh, electrons, photons, as well as uh, protons, neutrons, and other type of particles. And then we have uh, Penelope and EGS uh, and RC, which uh, typically uh, they only deal or they only deal with uh, photons and electrons and positrons. No, not with uh, protons, which is uh, what we are interested in. However, uh, there is a, a recent development regarding Penelope, uh, which now includes uh, protons, and, and protons can be simulated, and we will talk about that uh, later. Then we have fast Monte Carlo codes, uh, which they are limited in the energies that they can simulate, so therefore they can only simulate energies uh, within the clinical uh, interest, which is around uh, or of the order of uh, mega electron volts. They only simulate uh, or usually only simulate low Z materials, uh, that is those typical uh, in the human body. Uh, typically in bint geometries, those that we uh, find when uh, we simulate computerized tomographies. And examples of these codes are DPM, XBMC, BMC, Ray Station. The three of them uh, in this list, they only simulate photons uh, and electrons. Ray Station uh, simulates protons. And then there is another type of Monte Carlo uh, codes, which are those called pre-computed Monte Carlo, in which during simulation time, Monte Carlo simulations are not conducted. Uh, only lookup tables are visited, and these lookup tables were built uh, using a general purpose Monte Carlo simulation. So, as we gain in speed, we lose in accuracy. The, the, the main problem uh, that limits Monte Carlo, general purpose Monte Carlo codes, is uh, the simulation time required. Very briefly, uh, let's go through how a Monte Carlo simulation of radiation transport uh, works. We have uh, a particle uh, entering into the, the boundary of a material layer. We'll call it material, material one. And uh, we sort the step lengths that this particle uh, will travel using a random number. When we decide where an interaction will occur using a random number, we uh, sample which type of interaction uh, will occur. In this example, we only have two types of interactions, interactions type A or B. And also using another random number, we decide which kind of interaction occurs. And then using the interaction cross sections of the particular uh, interaction that was uh, sampled, we decide how much is the energy loss uh, how much is the change of uh, flying direction and if uh, any secondary particles are produced. And then we continue the simulation until we arrive to a boundary with a next material. We stop the particle at the boundary, we recalculate our step uh, length and we move the particle with the new step length in the new material. So to see how this translates into, into a, a code, this is a very simple Monte Carlo code. You see, Monte Carlo codes not necessarily have to be very complex. Uh, actually, they are quite simple. Uh, what it makes them complex is that we put lots of blocks, uh, simple blocks together. First, we define a source. In this case, our source uh, is a source pointing upwards, and we are simulating a low energy uh, neutron source. All neutrons are pointing upwards and they are emitted uh, in, a, in a pencil beam uh, fashion. Then, as I showed in the previous slide, we sample the, the, the flight distance. Here we have our random number. And then we sample the type of interaction. This is an, an isotropic interaction. And in 
all these places we have randomness uh, introduced. How this uh, works, we have here uh, a video. What we are sampling is, you will see it uh, right now, uh, is the number of interactions that occur at a given distance uh, from the source. So as you see, very few particles have their first interaction just after uh, being emitted. Very few particles can travel freely a very long distance. And most of the particles have interactions in the mid range. If we run the simulation long enough, we get this nice plot. And uh, this is the, the distribution of uh, interactions uh, according to the distance from the source. So here uh, it comes uh, several uh, things into, into the discussion that uh, all Monte Carlo codes uh, share in common. In all Monte Carlo codes, we are tallying uh, a quantity. Uh, therefore, we need uh, to compute the expected value of uh, that quantity. And the expected value is computed by taking averages of the quantity of interest. The quantity of interest can be the energy, can be the fluence, can be any quantity that we are interested in. Uh, the way to do it is that we run uh, many uh, simulations of many uh, primary histories, that is many primary particles. And, and for each primary uh, history, we compute uh, the, the quantity of interest and then we accumulate uh, this uh, value in a tally. And at the end, we take the average. Every expected uh, quantity in, in a Monte Carlo simulation comes associated with a variance, with a standard deviation, because what we are doing is uh, we are computing uh, a stochastic, uh, we are doing a stochastic calculation. This is uh, a plot to show you how to uh, correctly interpret uh, Monte Carlo results. Here we have a, a typical dose distribution uh, from, from photons in this case, uh, but to the, the matter of the, of the discussion, it doesn't, to the objective of the discussion, it doesn't matter whether it is uh, photons, protons or whatever. And uh, we are comparing our simulated results, which are the, the dots, with the, sorry, uh, which is the histogram, the simulated results, we are comparing with the experiment. Each uh, histogram, each bar of the histogram of the simulation has an uncertainty bar. And this is very important. Uh, every Monte Carlo uh, quantity, every Monte Carlo tallied quantity must come uh, accompanied by a statistical uncertainty. So, if I tell you uh, that these uncertainty bars are given uh, to a coverage factor k equal to one, that is, uh, we are plotting uh, to one standard deviation, then 68% of our results should coincide within the statistical uncertainty with the experiment. That means that if 68 must coincide, 32% must not coincide. So if I am telling you that this plot is given to k equal one, you can immediately say that uh, I am lying to you, that these results are, are fake, because it's impossible that all beings coincide uh, with the, the expected uh, experiment uh, with uh, a coverage factor equal, equal to one. However, if we, I am telling you that these uncertainty bars are plot to k equal to two, that is two uh, standard deviations, then 95% of the results will coincide, 5% will not coincide. Okay, here there are not so many points, so it is quite probable that all of them uh, are coinciding with the experimental data. So that is why it is very important to uh, give the, the Monte Carlo tallied quantities associated with an statistical uncertainty and indicate uh, the number of uh, standard deviations that we are using to indicate the statistical uncertainty. The uh, 
as I said, the main problem of Monte Carlo simulations is uh, the exceedingly uh, simulation, long simulation times required to obtain reasonable uh, results. Uh, the reason uh, ground that, that uh, is rooted to this fact, it is because the, the uncertainty uh, goes with the square root of uh, the number of uh, simulated histories. So if we want to reduce the statistical uncertainty by a factor of two, we need uh, to increase the number of simulated histories by a factor of four. And here you have an example of isodons uh, lines of an electron irradiation of a conjunctival lymphoma. And on the lower uh, right end of the, of the image, you see the number of uh, simulated histories. So in order to get more or less decent uh, isodose lines, you see we needed 200 million uh, simulated histories. Well, what we had at the beginning, one million simulated histories gave us this uh, horrible plot. So that's another uh, caveat. When you see uh, very smooth uh, lines in uh, isodose lines or very smooth uh, plots in general in Monte Carlo. Uh, take them with a pinch of salt. It's uh, many times it occurs that some uh, smoothing or ironing or some other algorithms have been applied and of course when you apply these kind of algorithms then all traces of a statistical uncertainty are lost. The solution to, to reduce uh, a statistical uncertainty is by means of the so-called variance reduction techniques. And variance reduction techniques are aimed at improving the simulation efficiency. Beware, it's, they are aimed at improving the simulation efficiency, not at reducing the, sim or not necessarily at reducing the simulation time. There are some variance reduction techniques that might increase the, the simulation time, nevertheless, become uh, produce a, a, a more efficient uh, simulation. Also, uh, the field of variance reduction techniques is a field that is, let's say, uh, maybe a little bit of art or more uh, an art that, uh, than a science because um, variance reduction techniques, if not properly applied, they can produce either biased results or produce simulations that are less efficient than, than not applying the variance reduction techniques. So with uh, all these uh, elements from, from uh, a Monte Carlo simulation, we can now figure out which are the, the ingredients of uh, a Monte Carlo simulation of radiation transport. We have first to define a primary source, the, the source of our uh, primary particles. We need to define a geometry file that is uh, the, the world in which our particles will travel. We need to define the material files that is the description of the materials composing each element, each body of this uh, world defined in the geometry file. We need to define the transport parameters which is uh, how are we going uh, to uh, transport the, the particles inside the geometry, which will be our absorption energies and so on. We will go into more detail afterwards. We need to define variance reduction techniques that we will apply. And we, will, we need to define also the tallies. That is, which quantities do we want to score at the end? Knowing that, uh, we will see some of the dosimetry problems that I mentioned to you at the, at the very beginning. Uh, the problems that we will uh, deal are first, the Monte Carlo simulation of single pencil beams, then Monte Carlo simulation of multiple Coulomb scattering of protons, and uh, finally, uh, Monte Carlo simulation of beam quality correction factors of ionization channels. This, so we're starting with the Monte Carlo simulation of a single pencil beam. This is uh, a work uh, in, that we have recently submitted. And uh, in order to evaluate this new uh, 
proton module for uh, Penelope. This proton module is called uh, PenH, and uh, we wanted to benchmark uh, this uh, proton uh, module for Penelope with uh, existing codes, uh, mainly uh, GN4, which is uh, widely used in this field, and also with experimental data. Our experiment consisted on, on, on the following. What uh, we have is a, a water tank and uh, we have a single pencil beam uh, from uh, our facility impinging on uh, this water fan. And then we uh, score uh, the dose using a matrix detector, which we can score simultaneously with 1020 uh, ionization chambers, the dose uh, on at a given depth, and we move this uh, detector downwards so to have a, a 2D dose distribution at different depths. So we can know the depths dose distribution along this line, along this line, along this line, and so on. We define each of these uh, lines according to their radial distance to uh, the center, the beam uh, central axis. This is a plot of uh, a simulation we did uh, of, the, of the problem. Uh, so this is a, a transverse uh, actual uh, image of, of this uh, water phantom. Here we have the water, the beam impinging on the water. This is the radial distance in that direction. And in that direction, we have the depth. In order to make evident the, the, the gray uh, shades, uh, we did not plot directly the dose, but we plotted the, the logarithm on base 20, 10 of the dose plus one. So uh, if you plot directly the dose, you just see a black line and everything, everything else you see it white. Okay. And uh, according to, to the common practice in the field, uh, the, the, the point at which uh, the isodose uh, surface at which the dose uh, drops to 10% of the maximum dose, uh, this line defines the core of uh, the dose. Between the 10% uh, isodose surface and the 0.01% isodose surface, which is this one, uh, this region is called the halo, and outside this region is called the aura. And we want to, what we wanted to see is how our code uh, performed in evaluating uh, the dose respect, the depth dose distributions respect to the experiment in these three regions. What uh, we obtained uh, was the, the following. Uh, well, sorry, uh, we use GN4 uh, as our Monte Carlo code uh, that we wanted to compare with, PenH, which is, which is the, the implementation of proton transport in Penelope. There is a code called the STERPIN, which is uh, also a variation of uh, PenH, in which the nuclear models were implemented by a STERPIN on an original PenH that only uh, had uh, electromagnetic interactions. And then we also compared with uh, our Monte Carlo treatment planning system brain station. And here uh, are the results. Uh, so for a beam of 225 MeV, uh, the central axis, most of the codes give more or less the same result than uh, the experiment. The experiment is plotted with the squares, okay? PenH and, and Topaz, which is GN4, give essentially the, the same quality of the results. And as we get away from uh, the, the central axis, we start to observe uh, differences. Okay. Uh, I want to, to look particularly at this, uh, at this depth dose distribution, the one at 10.67 centimeters from the central axis. Here, what we have is the experiment, the result obtained by JN, which is remarkably good. And 
here we have uh, pen age. The difference between pen age and uh, the results obtained by uh, GN and the experiment, all this difference is accounted uh, to the lack of simulation of uh, neutron transport in pen age. If we actually we did the simulation of uh, JN disconnecting neutrons and we obtain exactly the same result. So NH behaves very well, but it lacks the simulation of neutrons. If you are interested in out of field uh, doses in proton therapy, uh, which as you can see have a large contribution from neutrons, then you need to simulate. Same uh, results for 160 MeV, and you see the agreement in the central axis is more or less the same than we got uh, before. However, notice the change in the shape of, of, the, of the depth dose distribution by reducing by 90 MeV the, the beam uh, energy. And uh, again, the, the same effect because of the lack of uh, the, the treatment planning system Ray Station, which has a fast Monte Carlo algorithm, remember that uh, we commented at the very beginning of the, of the presentation that this kind of algorithms, uh, they did a lot of assumptions, nevertheless uh, behaves quite well uh, for the range uh, in which we are interested in. Notice that here, for instance, we observe differences when we are five orders of magnitude below the maximum dose. So this here we are looking into micro dosimetry. And again, the same results or similar uh, characteristics for 100 MeV. Another problem, the problem of uh, multiple Coulomb scattering. Uh, in this case, what we are interested in is we have a beam impinging uh, a pencil beam, proton pencil beam, impinging uh, on a material layer. This is what uh, why I talk at the beginning of uh, the different beam delivery uh, modalities that exist, uh, one, uh, several of which uh, have to do with the fact that uh, you put material layers uh, on the beam path. What we want to know is if we are able to simulate the spread uh, of the beam uh, accurately. And we tested uh, aluminum, brass, and you will see in the next uh, slide, uh, lucite, which are materials that are typically used uh, in, uh, for beam delivery. And all the codes tested here, theta uh, naught is the, the experimental result, theta p is with pen H, uh, Penelope, and theta t is GN4. And this is uh, uh, Moliere, uh, Fano uh, analytical approximation. And all of these codes, an analytical model, in this case, they give very good agreement uh, with the experimental data, okay? Uh, if we go to the case of Lucite, uh, which is used in, in the treatment planning, uh, which is used in, in, in our facility, and all facilities actually. Uh, again, we get the same good agreement. The only points that show this agreement is the point related to ray station uh, pencil beam uh, algorithm. This is an analytic algorithm implemented in ray station, which Essentially, no one uses it. Is there just just for the sake of, of uh, completitude, nothing else? Uh, but you see, in this case, this analytic algorithm does not feel, fit the bill. For the rest, we get very good, uh, very good agreement uh, among all codes uh, and experiments. And now let's go into. Uh, an important problem in dosimetry, which is the, the determination of uh, the determination of uh, correction uh, factors uh, for uh, ionization chambers. These uh, correction factors are necessary when 
one is interested in uh, using the ionization chamber that one has uh, for a really accurate dosimetry. And uh, these uh, ionization factors, uh, this, sorry, these uh, correction factors, uh, the whole community is working on, on finding uh, results and publishing them because they determine to a good extent the, the quality of uh, the dosimetry. This is a publication of uh, Bauman, Horst, Sink, uh, and Goma. Uh, they did not simulate an ionization chamber, they went to a simpler uh, problem in preparation uh, and to identify the, the source of possible differences that we will see that occur, uh, in which they just use, instead of ionization chambers, they, they use volumes of air, which it is the simplest approximation to an ionization chamber. Uh, an important quality to determine these uh, correction factors is the FQ. The FQ is obtained as the ratio of the dose computed in water in a small disk of water divided by the dose computed in air for the, the chamber. In this case, the chamber is just the volume of air. Okay, so here, this is the, the, the reference dose in water. Uh, this is the volume where the reference dose is tallied in water. And uh, this is the, the one of the volumes, air volumes that will be used. And this is the other air volume that will be used in the catalysis. And this is a, 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 a quite relevant uh, result. Uh, these points here correspond to the FQ obtained with uh, the, the small cylinder that you saw in the previous slide. And this one is, uh, are the results obtained with the large cylinder. And you see that even in this very simple problem, you have uh, discrepancies uh, among uh, three, the three codes. This is PenH, uh, this is Fluca, uh, and this is Gen4. And okay, although Fluca is compatible within the statistical uncertainty with uh, JN4 and PenH, PenH is not uh, compatible with JN4. Uh, more or less the same occurs uh, here. One could say that PenH is barely compatible with JN4. So even in this simple problem, uh, these uh, differences are observed. However, notice the, the scale. Uh, this is 1.130, 1.135, 1.140. So the percentual differences between these results are, are really very, very small. But this is the kind of accuracy that it is required in these kind of problems. Nothing to do with the, the accuracy usually required in those distributions in patients, which 2% is, is good enough. This is a, a, another article from uh, Goma and, and Sterpin, in which uh, they use PenH, the version of PenH uh, in which nuclear interactions were implemented by Sterpin. And uh, they computed this FQ, in this case, not for uh, air cylinders, but uh, for ion, uh, several ionization chambers. I am focusing on a particular model, the NE. 2571. And these are the results uh, obtained for uh, 225 MeV. Here is 150 MeV, and this is another energy. So this, this scale, uh, this axis uh, increases with the energy of the beam. So notice uh, in this case, 150 MeV. Uh, Goma and Sterpin, uh, they obtained this result. However, Goma and Sterpin, three years, uh, no, Goma and other co workers, sorry, obtained three years before with more or less the same code, ISPNH, but with another uh, nuclear uh, interactions implementation. Actually, the nuclear interactions implementation was uh, taken from uh, JN4. Uh, they obtained this result behind the, the triangle, there is a square, they obtain this result. So completely different. And uh, Wolf using uh, JN4, but depending on the type of uh, physics chosen, 
obtain this result and this result. So you see that you obtain results that are not compatible among themselves. Uh, everyone using, uh, actually in this case, the same author using uh, the same code, just changing the transport, uh, just changing the physics interaction models. And in this case, the, the same uh, author uh, or one of the same authors uh, slightly changing the code. Possible reasons for this. Uh, this is the, the geometry of the NE2571 uh, chamber that uh, Goman and Sterpin used in the last uh, paper they, they published. This is the geometry uh, that Wolf used uh, in uh, his publication. We are now together with Wolf doing again the problem, now using a new version of PenH uh, with different uh, nuclear interaction models. And this is the geometry that we are using, which is essentially the same than this one, small, slightly different from the one used by, by Goman and Sterby. Uh, what I am show, showing you now is the numerical data of this plot adding our uh, results that we have just obtained. This is, this is a work that we have in preparation. We have obtained this value that would go here uh, in the plot. Again, not uh, statistically compatible with uh, previous results. And 150 MeV is not the worst case. At high energies, see which are the differences that you are obtaining. So, uh, this slide I, I wanted to entitle it uh, instead of ingredients of a Monte Carlo simulation, which is, I am recalling the previous slide that I showed you with the same uh, title, pitfalls of a Monte Carlo simulation, because all of these points are source of possible pitfalls or inadvertently introducing uh, sources of, of bias. Primary source definition. Are we simulating a, a point source, a pencil beam? Do we need to use Fermi Ikes for simulate a realistic pencil beam as we did in the, in the case of uh, the first results that I uh, showed you of the pencil beam simulation? Geometry file. This is in the case of the simulation of uh, ionization chamber, this is a key issue. Uh, geom the geometrical description of ionization chambers is proprietary information of the manufacturer and uh, uh, the information that we receive from the manufacturers is not always accurate. The definition of the material files, there are many variables here. Transport parameters, uh, how do we define the simulation, condensed or detailed? Variance reduction techniques, definition of tallies, all of these can be varied and the small variations on all these uh, ingredients will produce substantial and noticeable variations in the simulation of the symmetry problems. I said the simulation of the symmetry problems requires, uh, is much more demanding in terms of accuracy than the simulation of those distribution of patients. As I said, every step in a Monte Carlo simulation can become a pitfall. And what we need is more work uh, in the field to improve the accuracy of interaction cross-sections, material-related quantities, radiation transport, and uh, in order to improve the computation of the symmetry-related quantities. And very important for the routine computation of out-of-field doses, uh, all these uh, improvements uh, will be uh, needed and out of field doses is now a, a major issue uh, when uh, we are talking about the computation and the understanding of uh, radiation induced secondary cancers. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll do my solitary clip because everyone else is muted. Thank you, Lorenzo. That was really, really excellent. And I think you also provided a good background into how Monte Carlo works and what are the pitfalls. Because as we know, with the computers, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, I have received a number of questions. Before I get to the questions, I'll start a bit more generically. 
Can I please ask you, what do you see the most exciting development in the proton or hadron therapy these days? Uh, it's, it's hard to, to say. Uh, now there's a lot of hype in, in general uh, about uh, flash uh, therapy uh, and I am getting a, a bit out of field and, and this is uh, uh, this is very uh, exciting and, and a lot of people is, is being uh, attracted. Uh, my, um, according to my understanding, uh, I think that it is very important uh, nowadays uh, to, to further improve uh, our knowledge uh, on, on the symmetry, uh, to link uh, our uh, dosimetrical knowledge uh, with uh, biological response and, and this I think uh, it is a, a very important uh, subject uh, area I fully agree. To, to go into it. Yeah I agree that sometimes we get too technically and physics orientated and maybe overlook a bit the underlying biology. Yeah. So uh, if you, everyone lets me, I will start with the questions from our audience. Uh, Dayananda from Chennai is asking, which Monte Carlo code do you recommend for the best accurate modeling in clinical proton beam energy? Uh, currently, I, I would say uh, GN, GN4 uh, with a, a wrapper uh, for specifically addressed uh, for uh, radiotherapy problems such as topas. That's what we use. Uh, Fluca also gives uh, excellent results uh, and also there is also a wrapper called uh, Flare. Mm -hmm. uh, I am, uh, I am a, a, a user and, and uh, let's say uh, very closely related uh, to the Penelope team uh, and of course uh, I would like to, to tell you Penelope. Penelope has uh, arguably the, the best multiple scattering uh, models uh, in the market for uh, electron transport or for charged particle transport, uh, also for, for the electromagnetic part of, of protons. Uh, the results that we are seeing with PenH are, are very encouraging. Uh, however, in the case of Penelope, um, PenH um, only uh, protons are simulated. So if you want to take into account uh, neutrons, uh, then it is out of the game. So I would, I would uh, definitely go uh, for, for JN4 uh, with Topaz, alternatively uh, for uh, Fluca with Flare. Okay, thank you. How do you see GPU as a solution for fast Monte Carlo simulation so that this can be used for routine treatment planning? This is coming from such in depth. Uh, this is, this is a, a, an issue that, that uh, some people, uh, quite uh, knowledgeable groups, I'm thinking for instance on the group of Steve Young uh, in California, they have uh, been we're currently trying to implement. The problem uh, with uh, Monte Carlo simulation of radiation transport is that uh, mm, ideally what you would like to do in, in a GPU is to distribute uh, one primary particle per uh, processor. So that if you have uh, 500 uh, processors, uh, then you have 500 uh, primary particles being simulated all at once. What happens is that uh, since we are working uh, with an stochastic approach and uh, with random numbers, your first uh, primary particle can have a type of interaction, a Compton, and your second particle can have another interaction, a Rayleigh or whatever, and all particles will have different uh, types of interactions. And this is not good for the, the, the architecture of GPUs. GPUs are, are meant to do the same uh, mathematical uh, computations at once, all of them, 
with different inputs, but the same. So if one is doing a multiplication, to put it very simply, all others must do a, a multiplication at the same time. And the, the problem is not well suited for, for mm -hmm. GPUs. The, the, the best results I have seen uh, with GPUs is an, a, an increase factor of uh, 10 to 70 at most and obtaining that by reducing uh, and simplifying a lot the physics. For a factor of 70, uh, you do not do all the effort uh, that you do uh, modifying your code and implementing yeah. it into a GPU. Yeah. So what you do is uh, you buy a more powerful computer. Okay. Um, Vasilius Boronikolas is asking, can we use GN algorithm for a pencil beam regarding the trajectory calculation of the beam and the depth deposition in the MR field, if you use, let's say, magnetic resonance imaging? For uh, magnetic resonance with proton therapy or uh, he yes. means in general yes. with? Uh, I presume this would be with proton therapy. With proton therapy, I, I haven't heard. Uh, yes, there, there, there are some, some simulations uh, of uh, LINAC MRIs, uh, this I know, uh, together with um, proton therapy, I have not seen. <laughs> but yes, of course, you can, the, most of the codes have the possibility to simulate uh, coupled uh, electromagnetic fields with, uh, elect with the, the simulation of charged particles. Yes. Uh, Sunil Sharma is asking whether the geometry of nozzle has also been considered in source term or geometry of your simulations? No, in our simulations not. Uh, what we have done is uh, we have tallied, uh, we have measured uh, the fluence at the exit of the nozzle and we have uh, derived uh, a virtual source based on uh, the experimental measurements at the exit of the nozzle. Mm -hmm. I have had a couple of questions about your last conclusion point about the out of field doses. Do you think that sometimes in the future it will be routine to calculate out of field doses for patients for risk estimation of second primary cancers? I think that we definitely should point into that direction and and this is uh, something that uh, we are uh, working in. Actually, uh, we are working in a, in a European project called uh, Harmonic, which is one of the objectives of, of the project. Uh, you, I mean, one must bear in mind that, that uh, for out of field, far from the field uh, doses, uh, computation, uh, accuracy is not that important. So mm -hmm. you do not need to, to get the dose uh, with 1% accuracy. Uh, yes. So even if we have, you know, uh, analytical models or some of those that would be more than accurate enough. For instance, yes, you can, you can, uh, you can very fastly compute uh, the, the dose uh, analytically to a point and then, yes, bec uh, use a GPU uh, because you are using an analytical model to compute the dose distribution far from the field yeah, at several points. Yeah, few people have asking about comparison of whether GATE is suitable for simulation of hadron therapy or whether PRIMO can be used for proton dose calculations. Do you have any comments? Uh, GATE, uh, for sure, yes. GATE is another wrapper like uh, TOPAS. Uh, I do not have experience with uh, GATE, but what I've read is, yes, it, it is possible. It, at the end, what, I mean, your computation engine is, is GN4. Uh, Primo, uh, no, uh, nowadays uh, not. It is one of our objectives uh, to implement this new version of, of uh, Penelope for protons into Primo and eventually uh, produce a, a Primo for protons. But this is, let's say, in the long term. It is, requires a lot of work and, and, and not certainly before uh, two or three years. Uh, there is a question from Arif about the dose contamination from a secondary fragmentation. Uh, 
do you have any comments? I don't think that whether this is very important in proton therapy, more in hadron. More in hadron, yes. Uh, not not in, in not in proton therapy. So yeah. we don't have to worry about it. Would you use Monte Carlo? Meyer is asking to uh, develop shielding, calculate shielding for proton therapy. Yeah, that's relatively easy, and, and this is this is one of the of the fields in which uh, MCNP is is very much used. Many people doing uh, simulations of shielding they use MCNP, but you could use also JM4 or whatever. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Mayuri is also asking, what would be accuracy of ray station Monte Carlo in the presence of high Z materials, if you are familiar? Uh, we could not uh, do that uh, because ray station is, is, a, is a black box. So yes. we can introduce some uh, materials. Uh, you see, for instance, we simulated lucite, but we were not able to simulate uh, brass or aluminum. Uh, in any case, it is uh, even though you could uh, implement it, uh, the, the code is not designed for that. Uh, mm -hmm. The code is designed to, to compute accurate uh, uh, and fast dose distributions in patients, and, and that it does very well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Gagan Preet is asking, what do you say about deep learning algorithm for mimicking Monte Carlo dose calculations in a treatment planning system? These no. questions are becoming trickier and trickier, oh, I tell you. No idea, <laughs> no experience I have. <laughs> yeah. uh, but perhaps that would be a challenge for our younger physicists up and coming <laughs> <laughs> to resolve in the future. What, what uh, some people is, is doing uh, in, let's say, going into this direction is uh, using uh, uh, artificial intelligence for finding uh, initial beam parameters uh, that uh, represent, uh, that can model your, your uh, source. Uh, instead of going through trial and error, uh, to using artificial intelligence or neural networks. These are some, some approaches uh, that people is now uh, starting and, and there's, there's, there are some very interesting recent works in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, Hidea is asking, can you give us a good example of improving simulation efficiency? There are many, many ways and that depends mainly on, on your, your problem. Uh, a very simple, I do not know if it's good, but a simple example. Uh, in the case that I showed you uh, that we were simulating a pencil beam impinging on, on a water phantom, uh, in order to improve simulation efficiency, uh, our tally, instead of using uh, uh, parallel epipet uh, voxels, that is uh, cubic voxels uh, to, to tally the dose, uh, we use uh, boxels uh, with this or bins uh, with the shape of uh, polar coordinates of cylindrical coordinates. So cylindrical. So we had uh, cylindrical shells, and and then we exploit the symmetry of the problem. So this is the typical example in which uh, you can exploit the symmetry of the problem in order to improve uh, the efficiency of the simulation. Okay, I'll, John, if you allow me, I will do one or two more questions and sure, then we'll... Sure, go, go ahead, go yes. ahead, Eva. Uh, Andre Katzberg is asking, uh, what benchmarking do you do against actual experimental measurements? I do not understand. We compare our simulated results with the, the experiments. Experimental that... measurements, as was the, yeah, shown in your lecture. That's, you. that's what we did, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, what, is there a free version of MCMP for a student? Uh, MCMP, I think it is free. The, mm, let's say the, the, the hurdle is that uh, you need to ask it, uh, I do not remember, but it's, it's a, it's a, a U, US uh, institution, and then they decide if uh, you can receive it or not depending mm -hmm. on, on the country, they, they have a policy and some countries are not selected. Mm -hmm. right. So it's worth trying. 
another young physicist is asking, we would like to learn GN4. Would you recommend any website or learning sources for a beginner? I would go to the, the, the source of GN4, start uh, reading the, the manual. There are courses of GN4. Uh, GN4, it's in general, uh, all Monte Carlo codes uh, are not, not easy. And uh, I mean, you can, let's say, relatively fast uh, download the code and, and get a simulation running, but to understand what you are doing and to understand uh, the results that you are obtaining, uh, I would suggest either to attend a course or or to go into yeah deeply into the manuals. So it, it requires time. Uh, there are there are uh, JN4 courses that more or less once a year they are they are run. So I would suggest to go to one of these courses. Mm -hmm. I will finish with the last lecture. Is there a difference in Monte Carlo code performance if the Monte Carlo is written in different programming languages? Sure, sure, of course. Uh, the, but that, that depends not on, on, on the Monte Carlo code, but uh, depends on, on, on the language. Uh, still, yeah. The, the, the fastest uh, language uh, for uh, mathematical computations uh, is still Fortran. Uh, and, uh, I love Fortran. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I'm glad that you say that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, Penelope is written in, in Fortran. Uh, then you have uh, codes written in, in C++. Uh, which is the case of JN4. JN4 is, uh, C++ is also very fast, nearly as fast as Fortran. Uh, but the, the speed of the simulation, uh, the inherent speed of, of the simulation uh, of the code uh, mm -hmm. depends mainly not, I would not say whether you choose Fortran or, or C++, but on, on the physics that you implement. Yeah. Uh, more, and how you implement that physics. And For whether Penelope you're is not particularly fast. Penelope yeah. has a very accurate physics, but it is, as you compare it with uh, EGS, for example, uh, it is very slow compared to yeah. yeah. Well, it sort of would then depend how people set their input parameters yeah. and whether they are logically set up. Yeah. yeah. yeah, and that's, yeah. and yeah. then it depends on the compiler that you use. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So in the case of Fortran, which is the, the one that I know the, the best, you can use uh, GFortran, which is free, uh, or you can use Intel Fortran, uh, which is commercial, but uh, you get simulations that run from a factor to two to three faster. So if you are talking about an hour, it doesn't matter. If you are talking about a month, it's not the same waiting three months than waiting one month. Yeah. Lorenzo, can I please ask you to stop sharing and I will... Oh, sorry. Talk. Yes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I remained here. Uh, That's perfect. It should be somewhere at the top. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I think we have run out of time, but I'm very pleased because we had large amount of questions. If you have time, you can go through all the beautiful comments left for you by the participants about how they enjoyed your lecture. And John, would you be able to let us know when the lecture will be uploaded or um, Magdalena? There have uh, been a number of questions about that. Very soon. Uh, and by the way, I'd like to thank uh, Magdalena, Professor Stoeva. Uh, she is responsible for all technical aspects and recording. Uh, and this is a great job. Great job. This means that the webinar will be available on our website, on IOMP's website very soon. Um, uh, tomorrow, I guess. So it's a matter of uh, hours or uh, one day. Uh, Lorenzo, I can, I, I, unbelievable. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you. Messages. I'm, I'm reading messages. Excellent talk. Many thanks for your valuable lecture. Excellent. Very insightful. Uh, nice. Clear. De deliverably. Deliverable. Uh, delivery. Sorry. Uh, can you arrange another uh, another uh, lecture on Primo? Another. <laughs> so it depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, lots of. Uh, nice messages, 
but uh, time is very limited, unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Lorenzo, for your great presentation. Uh, it was an excellent webinar. I'd like to also thank our colleagues for their active participation. Tomorrow, same time, another webinar. So this topic, the topic will be, it's, it's very, a very interesting topic. Management of radiotherapy patients with implanted cardiac devices. So, see you soon. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Good Bye. Night. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.